how a non-technical founder can start a technical startup. Yeah, definitely. I think it's an interesting topic. Obviously, I think in the media times, we we glorify technical founders. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, right, mm-hmm. for an example. And like, even after, you know, Facebook is a huge success, it's gone public, There, there's going to be this, some some parts of the media, there's going to be glorification around, oh, well, he he's still coding, he's doing this or that. Even if he's not coding for Facebook, he's doing some side projects and 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 there is this this feeling attached that general population that hey he knows something better than anybody else as far as you know technical financial all of those things um so i feel like it's good to demystify that a little bit talk talk a little bit about the success stories and touch on what it might mean for non-technical people who are looking to found companies today there is actually a movement of non-technical folks who want to start a technical startup or SaaS. You don't need to be like a coder or, I mean, it definitely helps. Yeah. It definitely helps, but you don't, it's it's not uh, a limitation yeah. in order to start. And one of the stories we covered in our newsletter, Zero to One, uh, the story about Calendly, the software that pretty much everyone who is, doing any online meetings ever used before. Uh, I using Calendly every day. You, when was the last time you tried set up, setting up a meeting with somebody, with two people who weren't using Calendly? Oh yeah, that's a nightmare. And this is... Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about uh, uh, Calendly. Uh, the founder, his name is... His name is Topa Watana. Um... He, By the way, you just, you said it brilliantly. <laughs> having seen him, having heard his interviews, him saying it, really, really great job. I'm going to stick, I'm going to stick with Tope. Tope Watana, he, yeah. Uh, what, what is interesting about him, he is also an immigrant, uh, like myself, like you. Um, he went to school here. He came here with family. He graduated university. I believe it was even a CS degree. Actually, I, if if memory serves me correctly, he started CS and then moved to business. And moved so to he business. Gra- yeah. He graduated as a business a yeah. business graduate. He he was not a coder or he was not a programmer. Mm-hmm. So he started working at sales at some companies, and I know that mm-hmm. he was working at Dell. Yeah, technical sales yeah, all technical the way up to like account executives right, right, and like, right. like really, really major accounts, big ones. Yeah, and he actually saved some money to start Calendly. And what is interesting, Calendly is not his first business. He it, it is is not it, it is not his first startup. He's he I, I saw his interview and he said that he started four different businesses. Two of them, they were e-commerce, like mm-hmm. selling what he was selling. It was like, wasn't it like yard tooling? Yeah, yard, yard, yeah, yeah. 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 Kind of forget forget the exact name, like yard tools or something. Dot com. Yeah, 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 something. You know, I would say something that's not sexy, right? Like <laughs> yes. something simple. You know, I think one thing where more than being a technical founder mm-hmm. right this this idea of being obsessed with a particular problem being obsessed with your users i believe while he was an account executive in sales for a big company is where he first conceived the idea for yeah. calendly just yeah. like just like us if we if we don't have a calendar and somebody else doesn't trying to schedule time is such a such a nightmare just just that way. He, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He saw a need for himself. He's like, this is this is crazy, right? He he has a need for setting up. He's he's dealing with multiple like million dollar accounts, right? Imagine, right? I mean, imagine try to set up a meeting over the messenger. It's pretty. I mean, yeah. it will take maybe yeah two three rounds. No, okay. no, try doing that over email. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> over email, especially with delay, right? Like. To say that a simple meeting can take you maybe a day or even longer, longer right? Yeah. 
with, with, with a delay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how 9 a.m. at Tuesday works for you? Oh, no, 9 a.m. I have booked. Uh, let, let's try the 12. Yeah. Oh, 12 is booked for, for myself too. Like, can we? <laughs> and back and forth, and back, back yeah. and forth. So he had this pain, mm -hmm. right? He had this pain. He said, okay, I think. Also, he did a research for other mm -hmm. um, scheduling apps that were exist. But none of them that actually were good fit. So he decided, well, there's a, there's a niche. There is actually a, a, a problem that haven't been solved or haven't been solved in a way that I want, <laughs> right? That he want. Yeah. And what is interesting, he, he bootstrapped. So he bootstrapped, which is pretty bold move. You have to be very confident in what are you doing, investing your own money, he invested over the course, like over the first six months of developing, around two hundred k. Yeah, yeah, that's the number right? I've seen. Yeah, two hundred thousand. I mean, I'm I'm not sure if it was six months, one year, um, but essentially, I, I believe it was to launch the MVP was yep, like two hundred. Yep. Yeah. And what is also interesting, he hired the development team in U in Ukraine mm. to to build this up. There is actually another story how they were developing because I uh, look over the interviews of that company, of the founder and development team of who was building for Kelly. They're still working for him. They're still working for him. So yeah, that's a very viable path if you have a seed round. And so all of all the development, is that correct? All of the development was the MVP, the first first cut of Calendly was all done in Ukraine. That is correct. Okay. That is correct. And not only that, they help him to find the CTO, the first CTO. Actually, I know that it wasn't very, uh, how to say, smooth of, of development. He proposed, well, I'm not going to say that it is 100% like how it was, yeah. but Based on claims so that I heard from the development team, yeah, they said that, well, he came up with a bunch of list features that he wanted to build, and that he wanted to see in the in the in the calendar in MVP. Mm -hmm. Those folks, he, I mean, they, he paying them, mm -hmm. but they told him like, dude, if you wanna make this um, app working. We have to concentrate on one feature, not like a bunch of. And yeah. they were arguing, I know, that it was pretty pretty intense, almost like he was leaving them. Yeah. But for some reason, he decided to also acknowledge their experience. Yeah. And that's how they started. Yeah. That's an interesting, it's a very interesting segue, because I think when you are a non-technical Founder, and maybe what I mean specifically in this in this scenario is maybe somebody who hasn't been on a software development team has hasn't hasn't been part of that sausage making, if you will, understanding sometimes getting that context on like how to make software, how to make a good quality feature, how to scale those things. Sometimes uh, you don't have insights into that yeah. directly. The, the sausage making parts of it. And, and that might lead to, you know, you may, you may want somebody you trust, or you may want, you may want somebody you can, you can have these healthy debates with clash a little bit, right? Because as that founder, somebody who's really passionate about that product, really passionate about that space, really pr passionate about the users, you, you want to be able to represent that almost as in like, if, if we, you know, if somebody is familiar with, you know, software development, you're the product manager, and you're a non-technical product manager and you're working a little bit different dynamics and you're working with a software development team. I feel like, um, you know, uh, at some point in time, we should definitely get, you know, get our current CEO to talk a little bit more about how he found it. Chow Now, Chris Webb. Uh, he's also he's also somebody who is uh, a non-technical founder, co-founder of Chow Now. He's the CEO and, and co-founder of Chow Now. 
and and sometimes it's you know it's amazing how those insights can be really amazing right he started with a passion for like helping local restaurants and that has not waned in these in these past 10 11 years that is still there that is still at the forefront at times we not always understand like the uh, you, you know like this is an easy thing versus this is a difficult thing mm-hmm. right some things can be like you're like well what about this product idea and we might be able to do it in like two weeks two months whatever right i use that as an example but other times we might be like well <laughs> that's going to take us that's going to take us four months to deliver and 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 that hopefully that conversation is a healthy conversation is the you know is something that's really important actually tell me this story like <laughs> how chono started Mm-hmm. There are other interviews from Chris Webb on how it started. So I'll, I'll give the I'll give the two minute version or or maybe the 30 second version. How Chow Now started was the, the co-founders, Chris Webb and Eric Jaffe, they met when he was working when they were working in in the financial sectors. For Chow Now, Chris Webb specifically, he was working for Lehman Brothers in New York, you know investment world all of that and and after you know kind of Lehman Brothers folded he was looking what's the next thing and it mm-hmm. started it started with uh, his family uh, investing in uh, a restaurant and that's how he got interested so he was always interested in food mm-hmm. but he got really interested in that space as um, you know as uh, as uh, his family was doing a little bit of due diligence, angel investor in, in that space, uh, he got really interested mm-hmm. in that. And then he called up his co-founder, Eric Jaffe, like, hey, what are you doing? Let's do something. And 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 it really started as a as a passion, passion project that way, you know, uh, all the way from, you know, whether it was like garage or or something that looked like a garage, a small office in Venice, all the way to like this, this big office in, in, in Culver City was was that was that journey. But in all of that, like the mission was true. Like, hey, helping local restaurants thrive was the mission. And and that that remained true day one to like year eleven. What is the MVP? Do we know? Yeah, yeah. How so, it was look like. Yeah. The the MVP was um I forget the name of the restaurant. There's I, I believe it was like a Hole in the wall Venice, uh, like a taco uh, burrito place, mm-hmm. and they knew the owner, so they asked him, like, "Hey, can we can we run an experiment?" So, so what they had was, I believe, something like a like a printer there that would print out an order, and and then there was an MVP that was you know on a web place an order. So the other co-founder Eric Jaffe was the first one who placed an order. And proceed printed out. They still have a picture of it. <laughs> so that was the that was like the MVP. So even before they went into, I believe it was Y Combinator. I'll have to double check. I'll put a correction in if I'm wrong. There were already customers on the platform. Mm. They had you know they had taken that MVP from that from that first stage mm-hmm. small mom, mom and pop shop who they who they asked like hey can we can we put this here? Awesome. Yeah. And it's also interesting. We have some, some of the like really, really early developers are still on the, still on the team. Still on the team. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the platform. You know, eleven years is a long time. Continues to evolve and and iterate, but that continuity is kind of interesting as well. Yeah, that's interesting story. So, did they again like um, their MVP? Did they bootstrapped as well? No, no, not at the time. Oh, so it's it's you know it's very interesting because it it has two different paths, right? Yeah. Compared to what Top did, mm-hmm. he invested his own money um, from day one and until until the sixth month. Mm-hmm. So first, I believe first six months he was bootstrapping his own money. Yeah. And then another interesting one. I don't, I don't know if I'm cutting cutting your thought, but another interesting one that was very similar, and there's additional conversations. Ryan Hoover mm-hmm. from Product Hunt. Have you have you used 
product hunt. Yeah. Fantastic communities around, you know, people who are interested in product, people who are making products, right? You introduce product, you get rating. There's a whole community around it. If you don't know what product hunt is, I was just recently watching an interview with him, maybe like six, eight months ago. But what was really interesting was him talking about now he's more, he's a full-time investor. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting about when, when asked about, hey, what, what would you, when, you know, when is the right time to, to take on funding? And he was like, he was like, well, you know, when, when I was launching Product Hunt, uh, I didn't really have wealth of my own <laughs> to, I knew I wanted to hire and I wanted to hire people, but I didn't have money to pay them. That's the reason I raised um, funding. I think it's, it's, it's really important. That distinction is really important. If you come from wealth or if you have an ability to raise money through family and friends, great, right? But if you don't, you have to go to the investment route sooner rather than later. And typically, you want to delay that as late as possible, right? You want to have as much equity in the company you're launching. Yeah. The sooner you take those investments, I think, I think that's sometimes people... When I, when I hear people talk about, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to launch a business, start a business, and um, I don't have a lot of liquid fund or wealth of my own to get to, to kick that off, they're like, well, to start it, I'll raise $50,000, right? Whatever the case may be. You have to be mindful of that, like raising that 50000 What does that mean? Do you have to give up 10% of the equity in this company, 50%? Um, you know, obviously it comes from a place of luxury if you don't have to do that. But I often see that from people. I don't, I'm not sure, you know, what are your, some of the things you've seen in no, that no, space? No. Actually, that's a good point because, uh, I mean, there's a lot of debates anyway. Um, uh, Top of what, uh, his intentions, he was, he was trying not to raise money as long as he can. Mm-hmm. And actually... His thoughts was about like, okay, we need to be profitable in order to survive. Like, you know, like other tech companies, they, and that actually it was kind of a trend when a tech companies like forget about profitability, f- forget about like, you know, be profitable. Mm-hmm. You have to be growing. That's the main metrics was, was there. Like, yeah, I mean, take these companies like Facebook, um, Right, they were just burning cash, burning investments in order to grow. Calendly, uh, Topa he did different uh, route. That's actually his yeah. his personal uh, experience. He said raising money is a bitch. I he said that I don't like this. It's the worst thing that I've done, and I don't want to do this again. So that's why he was like, okay, we need to forget about getting investments. We need to think like how we can be profitable. Mm -hmm. Initially, he's actually, after six months, he still had to raise some, I believe it was like 350k or something like that. But Yeah, was that his like series A? Or was that his seed seed round? It was a seed round and very modest, like. 50. Mm-hmm. And then I believe he got another 200, either like was a convertible note or something. <laughs> but the point is that for a long time he was pushing into be sustainable without any external investments. But in 2020, he still, he, they, I mean, obviously, like you at some point will, you will need investment to, yeah. to, to grow, right? And uh, 2021, he raised 350 million, and today his company valuation is over three billion dollar company. Yeah, which is awesome. Yeah, but definitely the, different. Yeah, the, what one since we're on the topic of uh, Canly, one of the I mean, there's so many interesting things about Canly. Like I can go on and talk about it all day, but really interesting about you know part of their MVP and their freemium offering. You want to you wanna do a little voiceover on that? I just find that subject so, so interesting. The funny part that they developed the freemium product. Okay, so the strategy was pretty interesting because 
before building the product, he was thinking, I need to build a product that you can use with other users. It should be shareable. It should be a multi-user product. It should not be a single user product. Yeah. Right. So in order to use this, I need someone else. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah. Calendly, that's how it works, right? You if you cannot have a meeting with yourself, <laughs> you have to <laughs> share. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they use this strategy and it really kicked off because they were developing this single feature. That you share the link, you choose the uh, time frame on the calendar, that's it, right? And everybody was like, wow, that's super easy to set up a meeting. And that was the, their free meal. Because they didn't have enough and uh, enough money to build a a, a paid product. Yeah, so, they, they ran out of they ran out of money to build a payment portal. Exactly. So once they, I feel if well, we need, I need to double check, but once they raised the seed round, they within several months they kicked off the paid product. Mm -hmm. And from that time, they became profitable. Yeah. Which is like. By that time, I mean, already viral, you mentioned exactly. the multi user aspect of exactly. it. Exactly. The, 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 the multi user thing, it allows them to get a lot of users. So it's, it's kind of interesting, right? He saw a problem that was very like personal to him, built a business idea around it. Also, I mean, at the, at the time, with Chris Webb, I think it was it was it was definitely something similar, mm -hmm. right? This is before uh, all of these food delivery apps took over the scene. Thought like, hey, how how can we democratize or or make it accessible for small independent restaurants to get online? This is before like that thing got huge, right? This is eleven years ago. There are a couple of there's one more example in my in my head was also something I need to do more research on. But the Airbnb, one of the Airbnb founders, Brian Chesky, right? As I've as I've heard of in more and more, just like that passion around around hosts and people hosting in their homes and 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 that connection yeah. with your users. You're not just you're not just building a business. Like when I think of these stories, you're not I mean obviously that you know you're trying to build a successful business, but you're not doing it just because of that. There's there's additional mission and passion behind it. And that's that's sometimes what's really important for a founder, more than being, you know, do they know technically? Do they yeah. are they know, do they know that industry? Are they technical enough? Those things you can definitely get help there, right? These these examples show us that. Yeah, basically all all, all those folks, they were passionate about some specific problem. They yeah. they were connected personally, right? Like ah, uh, I I'm so annoyed about this problem, or I'm really passionate about yeah. this specifically yeah. food industry, or local restaurants, right? Yeah. And I want to help them or I want to. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would recommend for folks who are like, who are doubting themselves, look at in incubators, look at their incoming classes. How many of those founders, how many of those startups are are made up of non-technical founders, right? The other example I gave was Ryan Hoover from Product Hunt. Uh, they also went through the uh, Y Combinator route, right? And you know they were they were obviously they already had a running product right there's you can you can have it you you can you can go to these incubators without you know some some are very early some already have a product somebody already is making money like Chana we talked about but it's really interesting to check to check that like not all founders are going to be technical founders and and these these incubators are you know they're betting on these folks right so bet on yourself I guess is the is that the 